with blessing in his hand. Christ our God to work this Our most gracious, loving Father, thank you so much for this wonderful Sabbath day. Lord, may your Holy Spirit guide each and every word that comes out today. And may each and every person who's hearing the word be blessed and be reminded that we are nothing but your creation. And it is our duty to honor you, fulfill your needs, so we can be ready when thou comes in the clouds of heaven. Please forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Church. I hope that you're all staying safe at home. It is the arms of the Lord which is keeping you safe. That is my hope and trust. You know, the Sabbath calls our thoughts to nature. The Sabbath draws our attention towards the Creator. It brings us into communion with the Creator. Though we are not assembled in the church together under one roof, but it is the one truth which has united us together. May this thought will bless you as we continue to worship. We will join our voices and sing song number 336 as opening song. There is a fountain filled with blood. Oh. 
reverently kneel and seek the Lord in prayer. merciful heavenly father in heaven thank you lord for this wonderful sabbath that you have given unto us what a merciful god we serve what a wonderful god we serve father in heaven as thy servant we come to thy feet we commit our church into thy hands father thank you lord for whatever things that you have done unto us Thank you for all the blessings that you have given unto us, Father. The very breath that we breathe, it is purely because of your grace. The day that we see today, it is purely because of your grace. Father, as we continue to worship, we pray that your mighty hand will be upon the speaker. May your spirit will talk unto us through your Son, Father. I commit all our church families into thy hand. As we go through this pandemic situation, I pray that your guarding angels will guard us from all the deadly diseases that is ahead of us. Father in heaven, we pray for the pastor of this church. We pray for the elders of this church. We pray for the young and the old of this church. You be with them and guide them in all your ways, Father. As we continue to worship, you be with us. And let the Sabbath be a blessing, blessing for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Church. Uh, sometimes we wonder who actually invented this procedure of giving tithes to the Lord. And why is it exactly 10%? Why not 9 or something more than 10 just like how God established the Sabbath and the marriage, God also established this procedure of giving tithe long before. And it applies to everyone who believe that Bible is the word of God. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 27 verses 30 to 32, uh, we see that this law of tithing was reaffirmed uh, for the Israelites. This word tithe actually comes from a Hebrew word which uh, is meser, which actually means 10 or 10%. 10 the blessings that we re receive from God are actually the income that we have and it's important that we give a part of it to the Lord. Let's follow Solomon's invitation. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9 he says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and the first fruits of your increase so your barns will be filled with plenty as we sing this song give thanks let's all take our offerings aside and pray to god and submit it to him give thanks with a grateful heart give thanks to the holy Is given Jesus. 
Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful Sabbath that you have given to us, dear Lord. And we praise you for all that you've done for us. And at this time, we have prayerfully kept the tithe which belongs to you, dear Lord. May it be used for thy cause, may it be multiplied. I pray for all the people who earnestly give their tithes. May you bless them, dear Lord, bless their families. I also pray that thou would bountifully bless them more so that they, can, they could give you more, dear Lord. I pray all these blessings in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Back in 2003, when I came to this church for the first time, I noticed a young and active man who was running between people and who was running between the the buildings where the lesson study were happening and I also noticed that he always kept a smile on his face and he greeted people with a smile. Praveen Jones, my good friend, God introduced me to him in the year 2003. Our friendship has been good thus far and I'm so overwhelmed and happy that the truth had kept us united in friendship. This active young man is going to share the word of God today. Please whisper a prayer in your hearts that the Spirit will speak to you. Praveen, over to you. Thank you so much. Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's such a privilege and a blessing for me to be able to reach out to all my brethren and back in India and all over the world today. What a rejoicing day this is for us to be able to spend some time with God in His Word. Let's say a small prayer before we get started. Our most gracious, loving Father, thank you so much for this wonderful Sabbath day. Lord, may your Holy Spirit guide each and every word that comes out today. And may each and every person who is hearing the Word be blessed and be reminded that we are nothing but your creation. And it is our duty to honor you, fulfill your needs, so we can be ready when thou comes in the clouds of heaven. Please forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. It was the year 1919 in the great city of New York. It was a time of great depression. And there was this one little boy by the name Eugene Yam Lang. He actually grew up in the city and suburbs of New York. And he went to a local school in East Harlem. There, as a poor boy, he struggled to understand and learn how can he come out of this neighborhood where there's a lot of crime and broken families and be able to rise up and be successful in life? Eventually, he did that. He graduated from high school. He went on to get his MBA from Columbia University and he became a very successful businessman. Years later, a principal from the school where he attended reached out to Eugene and said, Eugene, we would actually love for you to come back to the school and give a graduation speech for the sixth grade students. And Eugene felt it was an honor for him to go back and be able to speak to his students. And he started taking a piece of paper and writing it down saying, what can I tell to these students? They're sixth graders. What are they going to remember? 
how are they actually going to take what I take, what I tell them very seriously? He kept writing, he kept writing, he kept writing. Nothing really stuck. And then he decided, you know what? I'm actually just going to speak from my heart. So he came back to the day when the sixth grade graders were waiting for him for his speech. And he said, my brothers and sisters, you all are wondering, how did I be successful? It's very important that you stay on your path, never give up and focus on wanting to be successful in your life. And the students were all smiling, cracking them. They said, yeah, it's easy for a guy who made a lot of millions of dollars to say that. And then he looked at them and said, you know what? I'm going to give you a challenge. I'm going to actually promise you guys something. If you decide to stay in your classes and graduate all the way through high school, I will pay 100% of your tuition all the way through college. Now that, if I was in a position, would light up my eyes. Every student in there looked at each other and said, how is this even possible? Right there, there was a beam of hope beaming in their eyes. And they felt that there is something they can look forward into the future. And rightfully so, later, after years, almost 90% of the students graduated and went on to go and finish their college. Why did that happen? What was the reason? Was it the money? Was it the words that Eugene said? It's very simple. These kids didn't have a future to look into because there was nobody there to remind them that there is a future. Eugene gave them that. He actually told them, Stick, stay course on your path and you will graduate. And they all did. Hope is a powerful thing. And we as Christians, we sometimes struggle with the concept of trying to figure out what is the very definition of hope? Where can I actually find hope? Is hope even real? Now that's what we're going to look at in the Bible today. Psalms chapter 62 says, My hope comes from God, for He is my rock and salvation. You know, it's very easy to say that God is our hope when there are so many symbols of hope around the world. If you look at some of the stories in the Bible, right from the point of creation, when Adam and Eve sinned, their symbol of hope was an animal that was sacrificed and the clothing they had to wear from there. Move on to the flood time. There was hope through the rainbow in the sky. Then move on to the time when Israelites were fleeing from Egypt to the promised land. The staff that Moses held was the symbol of hope. Now, if you look into all of these stories, all these symbols of hope, whether it's a sacrificial lamb, whether it's a rainbow, or where is the staff of Moses? Those things were nothing but the vessels that were used by God. The real hope giver is who it pointed to, who it all represented, and that is Jesus. And that's what we're going to see and spend a little time in, from the book of Jeremiah and chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11. Let's read that verse for now. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. The verses stress the importance of Jesus being the central figure of all these things. It clearly states that in order for us to have a bright future, in order to have a life filled with prosperity, we should be able to pin our hopes on the only person who can give us hope, and that is Jesus. Jesus is the only person who is the author and finisher of our faith. He knows our beginning and he knows the end. And I want you guys to imagine this. Imagine this in a race course. When you're standing there to finish the race and Jesus is standing on the end at the finishing point because he knows how to get there. He's waiting for you to get there. So if you have someone like him who's watching over us, who's taking care of us, waiting for us at the end, what are we supposed to be afraid of? What do we actually have to even worry about? Because we have God who is there waiting to give us a bright future. Now let's take a pause there, right? We've established that Jesus is the hope giver. That Jesus is the one who knows the beginning and the end, is the one who is waiting for us towards the end of the course, end of the race, end of our life, telling us and reminding us that He has a plan for you and for me. 
Now that's phenomenal. But how do we actually get there? What is the way that you and me can relate in trying to claim that hope, in trying to walk and work towards Jesus? Now that's where we're going to take a step back again from book of Jeremiah, chapter 29. We're going to go back all the way to verse 4. We went fast forward because we want to know what the end picture is. Because it's easy sometimes when you want to travel somewhere, you pull up your phone, put in your GPS address, and you're happy to see where the destination is. But that doesn't mean that you're already there. That is something for you to look forward to, to know that there is an end point. Jesus has promised that He is our end point. He is our final destination. But how do we actually get there? I'm going to break this down in a very simple four topic lessons. We're going to break the word hope. The letter H, O, P, and E. Four simple lessons of how can we claim Jesus as our hope giver. Let's start with the letter H. H stands for hear the voice of the Lord. Imagine this. I'm going to take you back when you were a kid. For kids who are watching, you can relate to this. If you did something mischievous, and you got called to the principal's office. You go there, stand in the principal's office, and those five to 10 minutes are probably the most longest minutes you've ever waited in your entire life. And you're sitting there racing, trying to figure out what punishment am I going to get? But also on the other end, you're thinking about who is actually going to come and rescue me? Is it going to be my dad? Is it going to be my mom, my brother or sister? And you're just sitting there clenching your teeth and just waiting to see what is going to happen. Then your dad walks in there. He looks at you and says, what's the matter? What did you do this time? And the principal walks in and says, oh, your son did it again. And you're waiting for the response of what your dad is going to do. Your dad can do two things. One, he's going to say, oh, my son, it's okay. I forgive you. Let's go home. Don't worry about all these things. But you and me know that's not what usually happens in the principal's office, right? A father comes inside and listens to the principal. Oh, is that what he did? You know what? What was his punishment? Add two more in there and you'll feel better. That's what happened to the people who were exiled into Babylon. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 4. It says, Thus say the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Now we're going to take a pause and look at each verse here. Imagine this. These people who were exiled from the kingdom, they were brought to Babylon, and they're struggling. Their families are broken. The king is horrible. The prophets are false prophets. And they cannot look anywhere. And the only God they can look up to is a person who said, I'm going to send you there because of your faults, right? And now these people are wondering, where and what am I going to look at to get some hope? And then lo and behold, there comes a letter in a mail to these people from prophet Jeremiah. Imagine this, like the kids sitting there. They are waiting for a good news. They are waiting for a redemption plan. They are waiting so that they will be redeemed from the horrible situation that they are in and they can go on back and reunite, reunite with the families. But instead, what is the message? It says, God says, I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem and Babylon. It's interesting what God does here. He starts off as, if, as though he's actually putting some salt in an open wound. He doesn't say that, don't worry, my friends, I'm here to rescue you. He starts off by establishing his sovereignty. He basically says, I am the one who actually put you in there. He does two things there. Number one, he makes the people understand that God knows it all. He is the one who planned it, he devised it, executed it, and he knows how to finish it as well. And these people who are sitting there, they were waiting for a good news, but instead, they couldn't get it, but rather they just had to be sitting there waiting patiently to see what else is the message going to say. So the most important thing sometimes is that we don't like to hear the voice of the Lord because when the Lord speaks to us, we don't like what he has to say. Our belief is that the Lord's voice is supposed to sweeten our ears, but the reality is Lord's voice is not meant to sweeten our ears. It's meant to sweeten our lives. Because what God tells us is what is right for us. Even if it's not something that we're ready to hear, we have to be patient, trust Him, 
and wait there to know that God has a better plan for you. So the most important thing is that, like Revelations 3.20 says, Behold, I come at the door and knock. Whoever hears me and opens the door, I will come in, dine with him, and he with me. The more open relationship with we have with God, we can share our burdens with him and we can understand what his plans are. But too often we're so busy and caught up in our life that we don't get to understand what his plans are. So the first and the most important lesson is that we have to hear the voice of the Lord. Now let's go to the letter O. Orchestrate your life within the boundaries of God. Let's go to the next verse in the Bible, what it says. In verse 5, the prophet says, Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there and not diminished. It doesn't stop there. Verse 7, And seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall he have peace. Now imagine this. These people are sitting there, waiting for a redemption plan, and God says, first of all, I'm the one to put you there. And now he's saying, you know what? Get comfortable. Because you're not going to be getting out of this place anytime soon. He says, start building homes. Start making your lives. You have to be more patient. You know, sometimes in our life, when we are going through something tough, something troublesome, some trials, we tend to focus more on the end result. We want a quick win. We want to be able to just jump up and close the problem area and move on to something happy. But you know, God's plan sometimes is very different. He actually wants you in that situation. You see, if it was not for God's will, you and me wouldn't be going through certain things in our life. And these people, God was trying to remind them that you are not going anywhere anytime soon. Be there. Start building your homes. Why do you think God said that? Because He wanted those people to start building their lives, get accustomed to what's going on, use what they have, use the time in a more productive fashion so that they can continue to glorify God while they wait to see God's plan unfold over the course of time. Sometimes you and me do not understand that. We actually want to be able to get a quick win, want to be able to find a solution so easily that we can get out of our troubles and problems. God wants us to be patient. He wants us to get accustomed to what we are dealing with because He knows the right time of where we are, why we are there, and when it is time to leave the situation. You know, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4.16, Be careful about the way you live and about what you teach. Keep on doing this, and you will not save only yourself, but the people who hear you. You know, God reminds us that when we work in a place where it's filled with trouble and trials, it's not about just trying to find time to get out of the problem. He also wants us to be there to help others as well. And that's what the Bible says. Jeremiah, God through Jeremiah is reminding the people that your job, as long as you're there, is to build homes, live a normal life. And not, don't just stop there. You actually have to start praying for those people. If they are prosperous, you will be prosperous. You see, God was trying to teach them the lesson of being patient and trying to teach them the lesson that when I give you something, I have planned for you and I have planned to use you in that circumstance. Whether it's a bad situation or a good situation, when God puts you and me in there, His only purpose is to find ways to glorify Him. And that's the lesson of being able to orchestrate our life or in the situation that God gives us. Let's move on to P, letter in the word hope. Plan for unexpected events with an expected outcome. Now, how is that possible? Think about this people again. We're going to read verse 8 from 29. For thus say the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. You know, sometimes we're surrounded by people who actually want to give us misinformation. Now, there is a truest sense as to what the Bible is talking about, which is false prophets. 
who teaches false doctrines. But there is also the flip side of it where there are people surrounding us, around us, who actually try to distract us, try to deviate us from our plans of executing and being faithful to God. Now God is reminding us that our job is to stay focused. And even if you get distracted and get shoved away from the original path that you're leading towards to, don't worry because you're not that far off from God's plan. All you have to do is just look up and look at Him and ask for His help. And you can come right back on the path where you started. And He will be waiting there again in the finish line, encouraging you, empowering you, enlightening you, and giving you the spirit to move forward and never give up. It is so important that we plan for things that we cannot plan for. But what else can you do? When you cannot plan for things that you cannot plan for, the only thing you do at that point is to trust the person who has a grander plan than all of us. So it is important that we do that and trust Him and His guidance and His judgment for our lives. Isaiah 41.10, everybody knows this verse. It says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. If you are going through a tough situation in life right now, and you're, you seem like you're distracted, and you drifted too far away from God, don't give up. All God is asking you to do is just reach on to Him. Ask Him. Seek, and He will come and help you. The last letter in the word hope is E. Encourage others by being their beacon of hope. You see, the way these verses led all the way up to 11, God says in verse 10, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. Imagine this. You have these people here who are waiting for this redemption plan. They don't get any good news. Now God is asking them to sit there and build their lives around it. And God is also telling them, expect the unexpected because there's so many things going to happen. And then he's also asking them to start thinking about the betterment of others. And then it's 70 years. We don't even remember the sermon from last week. How are we going to actually remember what God has reminded us to be faithful for 70 years? And that's what the last word E stands for in the hope. God wants us to encourage one another so that we can become their beacon of hope. And why is that important? Because we just learned at the beginning when we started that if God is our true beacon of hope and He is our hope giver, for those who don't know Christ, they know you and they know me. So God wants us to be those symbols of hope. He wants us to be that beacon of hope so that when they know us, they will know Christ because it is through us that they're going to learn the love of Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, the book of Jeremiah is a powerful book. The chapter 29 gives us hope that we should never forget. But why is this all important? People without a future are people without prosperity. And in order for us to be prosperous and to learn and understand that God has a plan for us, it is imperative that we trust the only person who can give us hope. If our situation right now is so dire that we don't, we are struggling to understand where can I get hope? If you're going through a situation from an employment standpoint, we don't have a job. You know what? God has a plan for you. God is always there both in good times and bad times. When you have a child born into your family, God is rejoicing with you. When you have a death in a family, God is mourning and grieving, grieving with you. God is the same God when He decided that you and me have to be alive. God is the same God who has a plan for us all throughout the rest of our life until our last breath is on this earth. The only way I know this is because the, the fact that you are listening and watching and the fact that I am speaking here and we both are breathing the very breath of life is an indication that God has a purpose and a plan for you and me. And our job is to do nothing but to trust Him. For He will lead us all the way through and He's waiting for us at the finish line. Let's say a word of prayer. Our most gracious loving Father, thank you so much for being the beacon of hope and reminding us that it is now our responsibility to become the beacon of hope for others in this world and never take our eyes off of you, for you are waiting for us at the finish line, and you have only good things stored up for us. 
and all we have to do is trust, be patient, and never give up because you never, ever give up on us. Thank you so much for your blessings. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Father, lead me day by day Ever in thine own sweet way Teach me to be pure and true Show me what I ought to do When in danger make me Make me know that Thou can say, Keep me safe by Thy dear side. Let me in Thy love abide. When I'm tempted to do wrong, make me steadfast. Let's close our eyes and have a closing prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this wonderful Sabbath day. Thank you so much for all the programs we've been part of. Even though we're not in person, yet you've given us a privilege to be connected via technology. Thank you so much for the word that we learned today, that you are our ultimate hope giver. Let us stay focused. Let us find ways to help others this week. And let us remind ourselves that you have a great plan for us. And never forget every morning when we wake up that it is your desire for us to live a prosper life, giving glory and honor to you. Please forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. with